Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about the Potter Mage series. The first book in the series is called A Promise of Blood by Brian McClellan? McClellan? Sorry if I'm butchering your name, assuming you see this. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and talk about that book. I'm going to do a little bit of non-spoilery section, then we're going to get into a little bit of spoilers so I can talk about what I like and anything that I didn't like. So yeah, with that being said, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and let's begin. Okay, so the Powder Mage series. This one is really cool. I didn't expect it to start off the way it did. So in a lot of these kind of fantasy stories, it'll ultimately kind of culminate with having to overthrow the government or something like that, or someone like majorly in power. And this one kind of um, similar to the Final Empire in that the bad guy already won and we're dealing with the thousand years of the rule, this one kind of starts off with the good guys have won. They've overthrown the government. They've run this coup and they've taken over the government. So now we're kind of dealing with the aftermath of that. So I find that really interesting. So this story has a lot of the kind of political intrigue, political infighting, kind of moving and betrayals and backstabbings and stuff. And I think it kind of works really well in this setting because it is very much a political setting because you're kind of trying to reform an entire government while dealing with the fact that there's another um, government, there was like past stuff that was set up with the previous government that now have to be kind of answered for now. So they're dealing with internal issues and external issues, and then there's infighting, then there's like um, rats inside their, um, their group of people and stuff. So there's just a lot of that kind of information and that kind of energy, just like a lot of intrigue, political stuff and infighting. And then on top of that, we have this underlying mystery that's kind of happening going on around the main characters so we get introduced to a character who used to be a uh, police inspector who's basically now a private eye so we get to see a lot of stuff from his perspective so we're understanding the things that are like not being said but it's going on in the background all while watching everybody else deal with the stuff that goes on in the foreground and stuff so it's really really intriguing and this is also one of those um 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 I think, um, uh, if I can remember it, because I just uh, read this term recently and I didn't know it was a thing, is um, I think it's like flintlock fantasy or something. Basically referring to fantasy um, books that take place in a kind of steampunk, kind of, you know, verge of um, common industrialization and stuff like that. Basically where guns are starting to really, really take off. So this is a fantasy series where there's a lot of gun stuff going on. And it ties into the magic system. And this um, book has three different magic systems. They're all kind of related to each other. And it's really interesting. So it also branches the um, spectrum of hard all the way to soft. So the very, very hard um, magic is the weakest of the magic users. They're called the Nat. They have basically a uncanny ability. Like some like won't need sleep. Or maybe some can tell when you're lying or something like that. They have like one kind of ability that's very hard line it is what it is and it does what it does and that's all it is so that's pretty interesting so the medium one which is right in the middle and is also the one that the series has its name for the powder mage so a powder mage is someone who can ingest and metabolize gunpowder so they can sniff or eat or anything like that with gunpowder and they will get supernatural abilities they will get um, keener sight, better hearing, you know, advanced senses, strength and speed and like dexterity and stuff. Apart from that, they can independently and remotely detonate gunpowder from either someone else's gun or just in a random location and stuff like that. And when they do it in concert with firing a gun, it gives them essentially telekinesis over the gun, over the bullet. So um, one of the main characters is known for his basically his ability to shoot someone between the eyes from like two miles away because he can float the bullet that far so it's a really interesting kind of medium magic system there are hard rules as to what they can and can't do but there are ways that they can use it that give them almost what seems like extra abilities or abilities that really do fall more into the soft magic category but the softest of the magic systems that are in this story are the privileged these are people who can just touch the elf else sorry <laughs> like developing a lisp or something but they can touch the else and that is essentially the the nigh like omnipresent like under reality kind of magic energy so like they are described often as like being a cellist or something like so i imagine there's a lot of finger wiggling and stuff like that so they're like taking pieces of the else to kind of weave spells almost like will of time and like weaving magic in that way 
So it's kind of fascinating. But there is nearly no limitations on effects they can create. The only difference is, is like scale of power. Some are more powerful than others. And the really, really ancient ones are like God level powerful. So the only real restrictor in that magic system is just how powerful a particular person is. But there's a limit. If their hands are chopped off, then they're effectively useless. So that's kind of an interesting kind of rule, though, that they have. So this magic system in this story is really interesting. I really like it. And as far as that goes in terms of the world building, I really like it. And I think it's thorough and it's really well explained. But the rest of the world building is not great, in my opinion, because geographically, I'm not very ever sure where I am, even though they would describe, you know, they would describe the continent and stuff in this kind of way or what I perceive to be a continent because it's not made very clear if it is. But after I finished, I looked up a map and no, it's not a single continent. It's almost a gigantic archipelago of countries or whatever. So it's kind of interesting. But again, that's what would be one of my criticisms is that the physical part of the world building is not as clear as it could be. Like um, orientation to where one character is versus where another character is because you follow multiple different groups of characters. So I'm never really quite sure where we are when we jump back to this character. So that's kind of a, a negative. But the world itself is also very contemporary. It's very much like 19 or 1870s America or something like that. It is very turn of the um, Industrial Revolution, right before that or right in the middle of that. We don't get a lot of detail as to the level of technology that they're at, like as far as our automobiles ubiquitous at this point or whatever. Like, so we don't really get that. So it's not really made clear. Again, a thing that could be fleshed out in the world building. But of course, there's multiple books left in the series. So the chances are that that will get fleshed out later. So I kind of want to go from that and jump into my spoiler thoughts because overall, I really like the book. It is a really interesting book. It is a good start to a series. But so far, there's no real theme or through line. It's just kind of fun. It's um, interesting to see this kind of detective situation happen while watching people deal with this situation they've ultimately created themselves. It's pretty fascinating, and I'm really enjoying it. So let's go over and jump over to spoilers. So spoilers for The Powder Mage, uh, Promise of Blood, book one. <laughs> so the closest thing to a true through line that I think I can kind of see in this story is this kind of beware of your own arrogance kind of lesson, right? So we're at a point in time where the majority of people that are learned have basically become atheists. They think a lot of their um, early myths about the creation of the country and the way it all works and stuff is relegated to myth and legend and stuff like that. Now, not none of the educated people believe it or whatever. It's really that kind of thing. So the twist of it, of course, is that the detective uh, who's now a PI who's going through all the searches and stuff, he's doing this investigating and he's trying to figure out what is Kresimir's promise. They couldn't figure out what it is, whether it's a gang or something like that. And they come to find out that Kresimir's promise is a promise that was made by their god, Kresimir, when the nine, the countries that exist, were established and the people that ruled them were in place. That if anybody overthrows them and their bloodline is no longer ruling these countries, then Kresimir will come back and destroy everything. So it's like, holy crap. It's like, so we literally have to keep the same bloodline even if these people turn out to be horrible. Like we have to keep the same BS monarchy going. I'm like, well, that's some junk. So I already would have an issue with that as it is. But then the idea that then Kresimir is going to come back and punish all of them for doing it. So one of the main characters, Tamis, is like, uh, this is all BS. I don't buy it. But then there's a bunch of stuff that starts to happen that kind of lends credence to the fact that this might be a thing. Along with like the surfacing of these really ancient sorcerers who are ridiculously powerful. So there's just a lot of stuff going in that direction that says this is real and this is probably going to happen. So the through line, I would guess, is... Don't be so arrogant with your established science that you can't have a little room for faith. Even though to me, that argument, I mean, I'm, not, I'm an atheist. So of course I feel some type of way about that idea because some people would think me being an atheist is a, ma is a uh, matter of arrogance or something like that. But, but it's really not. It's truly just pragmatism. But the thing that these kind of stories always kind of mess with me about is you people have magic. <laughs> like, there are the knack, there are the powder mages, and there are the privilege. There is actual magic, straight up magic. No sci fi science based explanation. No, we can go down to the axie or the atoms or whatever and try to explain it from. No, this is out and out magic. 
So the idea that you'd have a supernatural God is not a leap, people. <laughs> like, so the idea that anybody that exists in this world where there's people throwing spells and snorting gunpowder and all this kind of stuff, that they could ever just really just, there's no God. All of this came about all normally and naturally and scientifically. But granted, the only caveat I can give to that argument before I just completely just like descend into a rant is the fact that this the the magics that they have that they're used to they're so used to them and they're so ubiquitous that they are effectively just science to them but they mentioned multiple times how the privilege they just can do whatever it just does like so either way to me it doesn't make as much sense that they wouldn't believe that their god exists but it's kind of a fun thing when it like starts to come full circle and stuff but we kind of get to the end of this book where um, we get the ancient ones that show up, the, the Predian, and they are trying to summon Kresimir, and then we get our main guy who can shoot a bullet two miles or whatever. He and a bunch of other people are trying to deal with it, and then what looks like the people, um, it looks like he was summoned. Because somebody magical based or whatever shows up, or seemingly magical based, and our main guy just kills him. He just kind of kills him as easy as he would kill any, well, it was a difficult action or whatever. It was difficult to do, but he just kind of goes down like any other human would. So the speculation that these gods were just very powerful sorcerers from somewhere else seems to have some merit. Or he's not dead, or that wasn't Kresimir and it was a feint, which I'm kind of leaning towards that. So now I'm kind of left with this. Was that him? Did they actually win? I don't think they did. It wouldn't really make a lot of sense if he just won that easily, especially first book of a trilogy. Like So, of course, he couldn't have, and then there's just got to be more to it. So, I'm just really looking forward to the next book. But, of, for, of course, I got to finish that third book in the First Law series. And if we get any more information about the First Law movie, I will definitely pick which book that's being adapted and jump into that because I think it's one of the standalones. So, I'm going to jump into that. And then we're going to talk some more First Law stuff. And then uh, probably some reread stuff. And then I just hope I can get back into some kind of routine because my routine kind of got screwed up for all of June. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. I really enjoy a Promise of Blood by Brian McKellen. It was really cool. I enjoyed it. I like the setting. I like the setup. I really like the magic. And I like the story that's being put forth. And I really can't wait to continue reading it. So let me know in the comments down below. Have you read the Powder Mage series? What do you think about it? Is Am I right thinking that term flintlock fantasy? Is that correct? Is, it sounds so wrong when I say it. Let me know in the comments down below. Am I correct about that? Let me know if you've read the book. How did you enjoy it if you have? And as always, make sure you hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And I will talk to you all next time. Peace.